Mystic Fire, video and audio, proudly presents Terence McKenna. History ends in green. This is tape five of a six cassette series. <laughs> This is sort of, I regard this as the, the freebie lecture that you could sit out if you had a massage because it's just sort of, a, it's something which I discovered is one way of putting it or dreamed up is another. And it's, if nothing else, it demonstrates the slippery nature of ideas. And I, depending on the audience I'm talking to, I present it different ways. Like sometimes I present it as uh, God's truth. And then like in Austria at this art thing, I presented it as a work of conceptual art. Uh, so, uh, yes, yeah, safer, right? So, and, and it is a, it's a concept, it's an idea that small computers such as we're looking at came along just in time or about five years after I first needed them. Uh, and uh, so I'll just sort of talk about it a little bit and feel my way into it. It's more fun to play with than to uh, discuss the theoretics of, but if you don't... Uh, you know, if you don't have some appreciation for the theory, then it doesn't make any sense at all. The basic notion is, or, or the way in which this idea parts company from ordinary science, is it, there is the idea that there is something which has been overlooked in the categorizing of the forces which shape and maintain the cosmos. Something has been overlooked. And I call this something novelty, following Alfred North Whitehead's uh, philosophy as put forth in process and reality. So novelty, and one way of thinking of it, if you have a background in Eastern philosophy, is Tao. What we're talking about here is pretty much something like the Tao, but we are going to call it novelty. And it comes and goes in the world according to mysterious and unfathomable rules and it builds structure up dynastic families corporations nation states and it pulls structure down according to some whim or some unimaginable algorithm that or previously unimaginable algorithm uh, and part of what got me started thinking along these lines was simply trying to make mathematical models of Tao. In other words, taking the statements at the beginning of the Tao Te Ching and taking them as mathematical formalisms and then seeing what the constraints were on a system that operated along those lines. Well, eventually that led me to look at the I Ching, which is uh, sort of the text par excellence uh, 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 relative to this idea that time has qualities and this idea of the ebb and flow of novelty that I was playing with I discovered was a notion that was very old in the East. It's not a notion that's even tolerated in Western thinking because science in order to do its business must have the assumption that uh, experiments are time de independent, that, that whether you do an experiment on a Tuesday or a Saturday, this is not a valid parameter of the experiment. Uh, however, this idea is suggesting something else. It's suggesting that time actually does have a quality and that uh, this quality so far introduced as novelty and its opposite, and I used to call its opposite entropy, but at uh, Rupert Sheldrake's urging, I now call it habit. 
And so this is a kind of Manichaean cosmology in which habit and novelty are in a constant struggle with each other. One gaining dominance for a period of time and then the other gaining dominance in an endless uh, dynamic relationship. The, some, the result of which over long periods of time is that novelty is conserved. I think I used this phrase last night in the introductory talk but without explaining the ideas which lay behind it. But the idea is that from the psychedelic point of view or from this point of view, the universe is perceived as a kind of engine for producing and distilling and maintaining novelty and passing novelty on to yet higher states of novelty. Each level of novelty somehow allowing the emergence of properties previously forbidden at more constrained levels so that the whole thing is a bootstrapping process to greater and greater novelty and self-reflection. Well, um, so that's the basic notion. Then the idea is, uh, following the statement of the Tao Te Ching, that the way that can be told of is not an unvarying way, and following the idea, the ideas implicit in the I Ching, that time is a succession of irreducible elements, that time in some way is made of irreducible elements in the same way that matter has been discovered by Western science to be made of irreducible elements. So somehow time is not simply a plenum, a featureless homogeneous surface upon which the experiments of Newtonian causality can be carried out, but actually when we look at it at the level, the fine-grained level of experience within the context of a love affair or a dynastic family's rise and fall or something like that, we see then you know, that it's permeated with qualities. And in the West, these qualities were identified by the Greeks and called fate and said, you know, to be is to be fate-laden. Somehow the fates impinge on our lives and lead us to our destinies. Science got rid of all this and then we just had, you know, flying atoms whizzing around in nothingness leading to some inevitable casuistry dictated by mathematics. Well, okay, uh, I don't want to say too much more about the theoretics of it, but inevitably the question comes up once we get into the wave, where did you say you got this wave again? <laughs> And the answer is it arose from a fairly stone circumstances but a fairly dry problem, meaning, you know, I was quite swept away and in the grip of the mushroom and so forth on a scale of weeks and years, not days. But it posed a conundrum, a koan, of a peculiar and confined problem, which was, what is the nature of the order of the King Wen sequence? Now, background. The King Wen sequence is a certain arrangement of the 64 hexagrams of the I Ching. And this particular arrangement is very old, found on, on shoulder bones, 3,500 years old and so forth. So it was simply asking a formal question. What are the rules which produced the King Wen sequence. It's always called a sequence. It's always revered as one of the oldest of human abstractions. But what in fact is the sequence? Well, in looking at that, and I won't try to lead, it through, lead you through it tonight unless in a question and answer period some maniac insists. <laughs> but uh, what it boils down to is that in the King Wen sequence of the I Ching, there is embedded a fractal algorithm, a, an alg a fractal algorithm very much like the fractal algorithms that have been discovered in just the past seven or eight years by modern mathematics using high-speed computers. And, but the interesting thing about this fractal algorithm 
inside the I Ching is that it actually appears to make good on the claim which the I Ching has always been so concerned to make, namely that it was a piece of prophetistic machinery for mapping future time. In other words, that it was a predictive engine for knowing uh, the future. So what I brought out of it, or what I was led to find within it by the promptings of the mushroom genies, was uh, a certain pattern, a certain pattern that I was able to mathematically nail to the wall and define. And then all the computer does here is time scale this pattern. And then I will become the devil's advocate for this thing. And I will claim to you that this undulating wave on the screen actually describes the career of novelty in time in all time, in all places, throughout the history of the universe. And we will look at big pieces of time, little pieces of time, and you will quickly get the idea that whether this is quote-unquote true or not, this is some kind of weird heuristic device that has about it the ozone stench of otherworldliness. I mean, it was not thought up by uh, uh, an, the unaided human mind. There, there's a kind of seamless completedness to it that marks it not as a discovery or an invention, but as, a, as an artifact of some other uh, order. Well, so now let's look at the screen, and, and if I can come up with a pointer, and even if I can... And I'll show you how this game is played, if the software will cooperate. The software is very good. It was written by Peter Meyer. The idea existed before the software, but before the software, these screens that you're going to see, it took an entire day to make one of them, and it just left you, you know, red-eyed and tremoring and there was the possibility for hundreds of arithmetic errors and any one of which would throw off the signature. So the invention of small computers in 1977 really uh, opened this up for us. Before we ran telephone directory size lists of numbers which we could then look up and and uh, you know, go off and then produce graphs somewhat like this. Okay, uh, now I know it's hard to see, but the main thing you have to see is the line and what it's doing, and then I'll try and explain everything else and make sense of it. These are novelty units along this axis, and we've never named them, but you can think of them as eschatons or or whatever, whitehead-ons. Uh, but this is the important axis, and this is the time axis. Now, what's being portrayed on the screen right now is six billion years. Six billion years. In other words, a time span longer than most uh, people require for the life of this planet. The Earth is thought to have condensed around five and a half billion years ago. And that very fact is uh, portrayed here because this, now, here's a convention that you have to internalize or nothing from this point on will make sense. It's very simple, it's, but it's somewhat counterintuitive. It's that when the line moves down, novelty is increasing. When the line moves down, novelty is increasing. When the line moves up, habit or entropy or recidivistic tendencies are increasing. Okay, well, so then looking at the life of the universe on a scale of six billion years, you see why I say it's an engine for the conservation of novelty. Because novelty, though there have been some severe setbacks like here, generally novelty has been conserved and right now 
we're down in here in this stochastic noise and uh, damped oscillation at the very end of the cycle, so close to the zero value, which is the maximum value for novelty, that for all practical purposes at this scale, we can say, be said to be next to uh, the zero value. And this is, I maintain, what accounts for the chaotic and highly novel nature of uh, modern history or the 20th century. It's that we are so near the zero value, the maximum value for novelty, that it's actually like there's an anticipatory image seeping through which contorts the 20th century into the kind of apocalyptic image-riddled social space that it is. Well, now, let's see. God willing, we can uh, make this thing zoom in. Zoom? Yes. So now we have 750 million years on the screen. And what was previously stochastic noise lost near the zero point is beginning to emerge instead as a repetitious landscape of deep lunges toward novelty. So now, uh, how to interpret this? This is about... 400, about 500 million years ago. So that big down sweep was the emergence of very simple life forms. But the major career of biology has gone on along this sawtoothed edge that is about 500 million years from here to here. And uh, this is in good accordance with the fossil record. This is where the great speciations and extinctions took place after the establishment of the Chordata about 500 million years ago. Uh, okay, now I'll restart the Zoom. Do you begin to get the idea of how what, we're, what you sh as the viewer or the jury or whatever should be asking yourself is, does the wave fit my personal interpretation and understanding of novelty as we move through time? Because we are obviously, at this scale, it's pretty much up for grabs. I mean, because we're talking about such generalized events as the emergence of life and so forth. But we're going to get down on it. We're going to enter, at some point, the cognizable domains of known history. I mean, let's say since the fall of the Roman Empire or since the fall of Richard Nixon, you know, depending on how, how long your uh, memory is. Okay, let me get this thing going again here. Here is the last hundred million years. Now, I, I stopped the screen here because there, w there is an event in the last hundred million years which this thing would have to successfully predict in order to proceed further as a successful theory. It's that uh, 65 million years ago, either there was an enormous volcanic eruption on the surface of the Earth like nothing anybody has ever seen or imagined, or there was a planetesimal impact on the North Atlantic Ridge, which seems to be the more probable candidate for what happened. And this laid down the so-called iridium here 65 million years ago. It's a perfect hit. In other words, the two cannot be dated precisely enough that we can't say that one is not precisely the other. So this is our first here at 65 million years ago. And actually, there was one earlier uh, I think 170 million years ago, which it also picks up, uh, but we've shot beyond that. So now, and that was the event which caused the extinction of the dinosaurs. Nothing larger than a chicken walked away from this event on the entire planet right here. And it gave the permission for the emergence of the mammals and the whole phyla of the earth took a sudden different turn, which was explored along here until about 45 million years ago. And then there was some kind of uh, carrying capacity problem or who knows what it is. This is really approaching uh, uh, the, uh, uh, the height of the speciation of the age of mammals occurred about 35 million years ago at the bottom of this trough. 
Okay, so what we're looking at here is a hundred million years, and this is the period in which we emerged as a species out of our boreal primates, out of bipedal proto-hominids on the grasslands of Africa. We come out of this, but most of the action for us as a thinking species is uh, on this uh, you know, this period here toward the very end, this perfect uh, kind of volcanic looking cone, which I call history's fractal mountain, mm -hmm. and which is sort of the signature of the whole wave, as you'll see as we get into it. Okay, now let's again start the zoom. Five million years. And let's look at this. Because now what it's saying is that suddenly five million and uh, slightly further back there's large punctuation in the novelty on the planet and we know a lot about this period and strangely enough what we know about this period confirms this model very closely because what these things are known to be are glaciations which begin uh, on this time scale and these low points here correspond very closely with the interglacial periods. You see what's happening is populations of human beings and animals are being locked up when the ice moves south. Then during the interglacials, these islanded populations are mixing and you're getting movement, progressive speciation in the fossil record along uh, uh, at the bottom of these gradients. And, uh, you know, it's a technical matter to match the glaciations in different parts of the world with this, but the agreement is, uh, is pretty close. Or, you know, a case can be made. 45,000 years, and let's look at this. Okay, this is a period of time where we actually begin to get artifacts, human artifacts of, uh, of an interesting sort. And... Uh, it's very hard to date the emergence of language, but it's interesting that one school holds that it occurred about 33,000 years ago and that we get this very steep uh, movement into novelty here, right there. This is probably the heyday of the Neanderthals because this is where the population of the Neanderthals seem to be uh, the highest and found in the largest areas. But uh, this is a glacial period, the last glacial period. And when the, inter when the interglacial arrived about 19,000 years ago, you get what's called the beginning of the Magdalenian era. And this is a tremendous explosion of creativity, uh, painting, ochre burials, ritual, movements. All of these things that appear uh, on this, and this is, I maintain, where this partnership paradise, this mushroom, pastoral, feminized, ecologically dynamic and balanced society existed along this gradient here. Then it broke up around 10,000 years ago. Uh, drying and the factors that we discussed shattered it and uh, there was a carrying capacity problem or something like that here let's see this in a little more detail but we're now closing distance with the cognizable domains of known history so if the theory is going to fail it should fail as the data accumulates and the dates become more precise We're looking at 45,000 years, 22,000 years, 11,000 years. Let's look at this. Um, okay. Now, uh, it, what it's saying is that after this carrying capacity problem around 10,000 BC, was, it was somehow overcome, and there was a very, very steep descent into novelty which reached its culmination around 6300 BC. 
Well, this corresponds very well with the dates for Çatal Hüyük in Turkey, which is this Anatolian town, 9,000 years old, that achieved a level of civilization that was not similar seen at any other site until uh, a thousand or more years later. In other words, until there were civilizations establishing themselves along this gradient. This was the last bastion of the, of the goddess partnership mushroom symbiosis. And what destroyed these people, we know Chattalhya Yuk level 5 was destroyed in 6500 BC by wheeled chariot people from the north. In other words, this spells the Indo-European bad guys uh, mm. who, who came from north of the Caspian Sea. And then you see this tremendous reestablishment of traditional pattern. Well, then along this gradient here, you know, when I went to school, we, what we were taught was history begins at Sumer. This was what we were always told, that it went Sumer, Ur, Chaldea, Babylon, Egypt. And in fact, those great patriarchal river-based civilizations established themselves on a gradient down here with Egypt right here at the bottom, establishing a new high water mark for novelty, a high water mark that would not be surpassed until the establishment of the Greco-Roman civilization over here. Along this upswing, what you get are a series of meathead uh, civilizations, <laughs> the Hittites, the Mitanni, the Assyrians. These are all kick-ass chariot warfare, warrior caste, uh, you know, that rigmarole. <laughs> all that's going along here. Then there's the great turning point. I, I mean, here again, you're seeing the signature of the algorithm, and I call it history's fractal mountain. It, notice that what I'm saying is that all of history, from the building of the Great Pyramids to the present moment, is portrayed by that much of the screen. And now we can go into this and explore uh, parts of it. Let's look at it a little closer. 11,000 years on the screen. There's History's Fractal Mountain, 5,000 years. Let's look at this for a minute. Okay, this is 5,000 years. We're still targeted on today. Uh, and what it's saying is that there was clearly a great moment, a single great moment of shift at some point in the past when a series of conservative tendencies, habitual patterns of activity were in a sense overthrown once and for all. And even though there was plenty of shit to be slogged through from here to here, the plot was inevitable. Okay, well, so what is that point? Well, it's about 980 BC. So what was going on then? This is the shift to... It's essentially that moment when Mycenaean piracy overwhelmed the goddess religion and the Greeks stopped being fishermen and pulled their boats up on the shore and started to talk philosophy. And that set off a cascade of cultural effects that, to the, that then reverberate to this day. It comes down along this gradient. Then down here you get the fall of Rome. Then since the fall of Rome you get this series of wildly oscillating cultural effects until as recently as the European Enlightenment in 1740, when the wave then drops to yet lower levels and begins to explore forms of novelty related to the human machine integration and electromagnetic technology and so forth and so on. We'll look at this, but I just wanted to call your attention to this and for another reason, there's a concept here which I haven't talked about yet, but which is good to introduce now. And that is the concept of resonance. Because this algorithm is fractal, because it is self-nested on many levels, you encounter the same topological manifold over and over again. Well, since we're looking at history, it's natural to make the analogical assumption 
that these repetitious uh, topologies are somehow related to each other so that there's a suggested in this theory a series of natural nested cycles where for instance every 67 years all the themes of the previous 4,306 years are somehow condensed and acted out. And it's the interface and interference patterns set up by these times, these times in the past and in the future, uh, sliding against each other that create phenomena like fads and fashions and outbreaks of hysteria and weird taste things and ripples in the collective mind. Uh, okay, so this is the signature of history's fractal mountain. Greco-Roman civilization and its spectrum of effects are this long cascade down here. Now let's look at it a little more. 1430 years. And uh, this I wanted you to see because this is the period of history that we all know the most about and strangely enough the wave is very willing to make predictions in this region of history this is one of those levels of magnification where the ebb and flow of novelty is predicted as very radical and highly punctuated so he looks for his crib sheet here um, so when you go through this and you're trying to understand what's going on, you're, you're the, supposed to have novelty occurring at the bottoms of these troughs. Well, this one in uh, the 930s, in the 10th century, is uh, the, uh, the culmination of Islam, the creation of the caliphates of Baghdad, and... Uh, Extreme, and this was the one where Europe gets left out. All this mathematics and poetry and alchemy is being created down here. Then there's a series of, of bounce-offs, recidivist tendencies, until you get uh, over to this one, which is uh, about 1119. And what this is all about is uh, it's the height of the Gothic revival and of uh, the Crusades. The people who are ha active in the bottom of that thing are people like Bernard of Clairvaux, Peter Lombard, Eleanor of Aquitaine, Thomas of Becket, Pope Adrian the Fourth. You know all those folks famous from Masterpiece Theater. They were all <laughs> happening right down there. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, you know, <clears throat> then the next steep descent into novelty is this one here in 1355, 1354, 56. Well, this was the greatest demographic catastrophe that Europe ever experienced. It was the Black Death. A third of the population of Europe died there. Uh, okay, well, then this one, this very steep plunge into novelty. The top up here is 1440. Gutenberg is inventing printing in Mainz near Frankfurt. And by the time you get to the bottom down here, it's 1492. The entire Italian Renaissance lies on the gradient of that plunge. So you see what the argument is, and it seems to emerge with more clarity as we have more data, is that history is actually some kind of process on a vast scale that is under the control of this particular mathematical uh, algorithm for some reason. I mean, this is the fractal dimension of the historical unfolding of the experience of the species. Uh, what you get down here is the discovery of the new world, the lost half of the planet, and that sets off a round of discovery and exploration that keeps things novel for a while. But then slavery gets reestablished and a whole bunch of bad social habits take root, and it pushes it clear back up to here. But then this is the beginning of the European Enlightenment, and, uh, and it descends very rapidly, uh, 
with then the American Revolution, the French Revolution, and the, ne and the Napoleonic Restoration all down in the bottom of this trough. Well, then let's go forward just a little bit more. The 20th century is coming up. Now, there it is. Uh, now, remember how I called it history's fractal mountain and we looked at it on a scale of 4,000 years? Well, it was this signature, something very like it, with just slight scaling differences. Uh, within the 20th century, from 1945 to 2012, we're recapitulating in some weird way all the themes of the previous 4,306 year cycle. So, for instance, the way this game is played is, remember I said that we had the old riverine empires down coming along this gradient and that down here we got the Egyptian manifest, cultural manifestation? Well, now we're looking at the 20th century we're seeing the resonances of the Egyptian cultural manifestation and we see that they reached their culmination in 1933 to 36. So what this is saying is that the quality of this trough is uh, uh, a millenarian cult based on the deification of a leader figure coupled with a hysterical obsession with tasteless architecture. <laughs> and we see this set of themes played out both in Pharaonic Egypt and in the Third Reich, of course. I mean, and once you see that one is the resonance of the other, you see, of course, of course, that's clearly what was going on. Well, then remember I said that the great turning point in human history was when the Mycenaean pirates uh, squashed the Minoan goddess-loving folks and set off the cultural cascade of Greco-Roman civilization. Well, in this scheme of things, that moment happens right up here in early 1967. And, of course, if you lived through that moment, you know that you know, there was a kind of pagan uh, revival right there, which then got smashed, and then we rode our way down into this long set of cascades into then the wild oscillation of the present. And one of the things that I wanted to talk about a little bit tonight is how we've actually entered into a new kind of time it began about three or four years ago, three, two years ago, depending. What it has to do with is, for a long time we were on a descending gradient into ever greater novelty as we approached this asymptotically increasing novelty. Now we are so close to it that we have begun to oscillate around a mean. And this explains, you know, the end of the Cold War, um, the breakup of the Soviet Union, a number of things, and we are going to live in this kind of time uh, unto the culmination of the time wave itself, which occurs in 2012. The time wave is unable to make predictions past 2012 AD. One of them is its self-limiting property, because as a fractal description of a data field, it only works if you assume that the whole thing wraps itself around itself and disappears up its own gullet on December 2012 AD, only 22 years in the future. Now there, we could talk about how, how could this be and what does it mean. What I think it means is that the presence of self-reflecting organisms, people, on this planet indicates the nearby presence or the potential uh, eminent emergence of some higher state of organization. We are not simply the startled witnesses to this emergence of a new level of organization. Our presence here is the first indication that it's going to happen. It's almost like you can think of a pond. When the surface of the pond begins to churn, you know, the smart money knows that something is moving toward the surface and is going to burst through. Well, history, human history, all this dream exchange and information trading and lying and so forth that goes on, is the churning of the surface of the pond. 
and the smart money should know, you know, that there's a momentous hidden force moving beneath the surface that all this is presaging. And so I think this is that kind of thing that as we approach the the hyperdimensional meltdown point or the uh, um, chronosynclastic infundibulum, uh, uh, precursive images of it will be thrown off. I think everybody's visions now tend to take the form of totality symbols. And uh, this is because it's constellating itself into a totality. We are so close now to the trans-dimensional object that it invades our dreams, our advertising, our waking fantasy, our art, our mathematics. Everything is contorted by the attraction of this uh, transcendental object. Blake talked about this kind of thing. Anyway, now, let's go in a little closer there because, uh, well, to humor me, basically. 44 years, here's 1967. It's pointing at today, remember. 22 years. 11 years. 5 years. Now let's stop it and look at it for a minute so we can see how we're doing. This is the last five years. Well, it's not so much the last five years. It's pointing at today. It's, that's today. And what we've got is two years, nine months, and 16 days on the screen. Okay, well, what's it saying here? It's pre it predicted a, a novel, high novelty maxima here, 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 and then here, which we haven't gotten to yet. But we've been through all of this, so let's uh, see how we're doing. Uh, okay, to the day, to the day, this high novelty maxima corresponds to um, the business in Tiananmen Square. Not the massacre, which is slightly off the trough and up on this side. But the day they put a million people into the square peaceably is right at the bottom of that thing. Well, okay, so then we know that that ended unhappily. There was a reassertion of traditional patterns, i.e. shooting students. What could be more traditional than that? <laughs> so there was a lot of that. And then uh, that sort of peaked out. And then there was another try at a novel maxima and at the bottom of this one, uh, the Berlin Wall is torn down, right at the bottom of this one. So there's two hits in a row. Now, you remember that after the Berlin Wall was torn down, there were a series of revolutions, Czechoslovakia, Poland, Bulgaria, and then finally Romania going over the top, and that they became progressively uglier progressively more in the traditional mold, meaning costing more life, and that last, that week between Christmas and New Year's of last year when the footage was coming in from the radio station in Romania, it was fairly grim. Well, that was as we went over the peak of this anti-novel or, or habitual thing. Then we started a long, slow meander downward, which was fairly gradual, and a lot of stuff, you know, seemed fairly irrelevant to us. It was all about the new German order and the SNL scandal. And it, but then we got to the bottom of this. It's not quite as deep as this, but we reached it uh, on the 3rd of August. We reached it uh, when Saddam Hussein invaded Kuwait. Now, let me see if I know what I'm talking about. Let's see if I can move this arrow a little. Yes, there's the 27th of July. At that point, they're massed on the border and so forth. And then the invasion takes place just a few days later. Well, um, what can we say about the prognosis for the future based on what we're looking at? This concludes Side A.
well, number one, I think probably everyone would be advised to stay fairly liquid in their portfolios <laughs> because uh, this crisis is being very carefully managed, but only up to a point. And at that point, it goes over the lip. And this, the Tiananmen Square massacre point, is the previously most novel point ever tested in the history of, uh, you know, the cosmos. So uh, at some point next de late December or early next January, we're going to push through that, having been on this long slide down. Uh, so now, uh, so it's not a very good prognosis unless you're in the novelty business. In terms of an absolute prediction, what this is saying is that the big change to watch for is around the 20th of November. The elections will be over the week between thank the end of the... And you can tell, you can tell, you can feel the momentum the inevitability of it. I mean, they'll be very hard pressed to hold it together till then. If we focus in there, let's take a look at that. See how it ripples. See how at the end it begins to come apart. You can't even tell where the top of the peak is because obviously they just get it all piled up. These shitloads and shitloads of bombs and gas and all this stuff. And then it rattles out of their control and then there's a bifurcation, a phase split, and down she comes. That's what, November 20th? Uh, let's, yeah, November 20th. Uh-huh. So then I thought that this was pretty interesting. So then I want to show you something else. I want to completely change our target date and everything. Let's uh, use the command C. Yes. Okay. Uh, what we're looking at now is 200 years. And these 200 years are from 499 A.D. until 699 A.D. Now, why are we looking at these years? Do you remember how in what we were just looking at, I said that we came down, that I said that the Berlin Wall was here, the Romanian Revolution was here, then the SNL crisis and all that, then Saddam Hussein invaded uh, uh, Kuwait here at the bottom of this and that I expected war to break out at the top of this. Now we're looking at the historical resonance of what we were just looking at before. We're looking at a much larger span of time. And what I want to show you is that when we put it uh, close to where Saddam Hussein invaded uh, Kuwait that's where he invaded Kuwait it tells us that the resonant date is 579 the date for the birth of Muhammad is 571 so when you move it to 571 it's only off by that much so what this means is that this situation in the Middle East, we have chosen to confront this guy at a period when the resonance which backs up what he is doing is the resonance of the birth and career of the prophet himself. Now, when you move it over to the, war, the, the date, the resonance which corresponds with the, the 25th of November, it's 599. The Hegira was in 622 down there, and then Muhammad didn't live much longer after that. But the gains of Islam were all put in place. I mean, this is the great gradient along which Islam made its major territorial and ideological claims over the last millennium. What does this correspond to uh, in, in terms of... Uh, next year it corresponds to uh, the 30th of March the 30th of March corresponds to uh, the Hegira and the subsequent death of Mohammed so what it means is that you know in the way that history is both a plotted and unconscious process we have managed to stumble in to 
a situation where we will probably be sacrificed to uh, the engine of historical inevitability. It's no moment to confront Islam. I think probably Allah will be very merciful to the <laughs> armies of the Caliph. But, you know, then there's a faction which is saying, oh, well, so is this the end of the world? And is this Armageddon? And yak, yak. No, of course not. All this is practically a memory by 1996 or 7 when whole other problems loom. I mean, no, it's just some kind of crazy military adventure cloaked in the form of a World War Two and a half or something. Uh, there will be a lot of this stuff if this wave is correct as we move toward the millennium and beyond it because you see what's happening is all these historical themes the birth and expansion of Islam the rise of medieval Europe the birth of the machine age this so and so and forth all of this stuff is going to occur in a compressed form between now and 2012 AD. I mean, this is my hypothesis. This is the truly odd um, notion that the mushroom wants to put forth, that the universe is not going to exist for billions or even hundreds of millions of years into the future, that actually the historical process signifies something loose in the informational domain that is very strictly self-limiting and so history doesn't go off millennia into the future history because of the way in which it is uh, feeds back into technological development history is some kind of self-limiting process that transforms the material that it works upon and the material that it works upon are uh, you know human human lives human destinies uh, I would never have come to this idea myself. I mean, it's too irrational for me. But when you but when you think, you know, you can then once it's articulated, make a case for it. I mean, after all, what is the counter case? What's what do straight people have to offer? Well, what straight people have to offer is that the universe sprang from nothingness in a single instant from an object whose diameter was less than that of a single electron. Well, hell, if you could buy into that, what, what couldn't you buy into? I mean, it's like the grossest series of the imponderabilities and unlikelihoods that you could string together. Yeah. What does happen if you extrapolate the curve backwards to 20 billion years before the event? You mean, where does this go? Yeah, you started at 6 billion years. What if you had started at 20 billion years ago? Uh, ah, well, the duration of the wave, it has no... <coughs> oh, excuse me. The, the wave has no um, defined physical duration because it's a mathematical entity. It does have convenient breakpoints at 72 billion years and... Um, 1.5 billion years and because we know there are things that have gone on that have taken 0.5 billion years but we don't know of anything that's gone on that's taken more than 72 billion years we've sort of rested with the assumption that 72 billion years is the duration do you see the, how the idea of the resonance works? It works in a very literary fashion, somewhat in the way that James Joyce wrote Ulysses. You know, Ulysses is the story of a man who seeks to buy kidneys for his breakfast in Dublin. But in so doing, he manages to be Ulysses and to visit all the ports of call that are listed and mentioned in the Odyssey. In other words, it's allegory, it's internalization of a scheme of action in one time and place and transferring it to another. But I think that this is how life is really put together and that this is what psychedelics teach you on one level is one way of putting it is Rome falls nine times an hour and you just have to be paying attention nine times an hour to see it go by 
and everything else happens nine times an hour and three times a day and once a week and twice a month and four times a year and eight times a millennium and so forth and so on and we're stacked up inside this system of resonances, historical references, ghosts, scattered mirages, images, the memories of the casuistry of past events, yeah. So when you say 2012, what, I'm, not, I'm sorry what you're saying, you're saying then we no longer resonate with these other times in the past, and is that what they mean by the end of ordinary history? Well, yeah, I sort of fudged. I didn't say what happens in 2012. I don't, I don't really know. I imagine it to be this fairly grandiose event that has to do with, uh, you know, how I said the universe is a machine for the conservation of novelty, but that it conserves and produces novelty at an ever faster and faster rate, and that the presence of human history actually indicates that we have entered into what Whitehead called the short epochs, meaning kinds of time that are coherent unto themselves but that may last only a few centuries or only a few decades, you know, I mean, the way in which the 20th century is a time unto itself. Well, I see this speeding up and speeding up until the point where nobody will be unaware of the fact that the whole space-time continuum is somehow collapsing on itself. It's a fairly literary idea because we're accustomed to thinking of space-time as just sort of hanging around. We're not accustomed to the idea of it migrating toward a point. But I think that the whole human species is involved in birthing some kind of alchemical object or some kind of transcendental something and that you know the reason our history is haunted by messiahs and prophets and wild-eyed characters preaching doom and redemption is because in our dreams in our visions we're picking up like five percent seepage from the transcendental object in hyperspace and it's what gives history a kind of direction. You know, I said that the academic theory of history was that it was a right. random the walk. The object in hyperspace is, is picking up the vibrations from that's the thing in the future. Yes, and it's giving history a kind of compass uh -huh. so that we keep correcting our course. We don't even, we're not even aware this is what we're doing, but we are actually stumbling toward and <laughs> defining into narrower and narrower areas this thing that we're after. And when we finally grab onto it, it you know, It'll be wonderful, according to me. It'll <laughs> be the f flesh made word, or, you know, the year of the jackpot, or something like that. How is the year 2012 arrived? Is that what the, the algorithm pointed toward? Yes, the algorithm pointed toward that in, when, in that when we saw it best fit between the curve and the point toward 2012, then what was a good confirmation or a, you know, a curious coincidence, depending on where you stand, is that the whole Mayan calendrical axis turns out to rotate on the same day, the exact same day, for some reason, the Maya, who had a calendar of 5,306 years of 13 bhaktins, 13 cycles, made the winter solstice of 2012 AD the axis point of their whole calendrical machinery. Now, the only thing I have in common with the Maya is we both have this affiliation with the mushroom. Is it conceivable? It's barely conceivable to me that the, the message in the mushroom is specific enough that no matter in what time or place you take it, it directs you toward a specific solsticeal event and a particular annual journey of the planet around the sun. Then the question becomes, you know, well, there are a number of questions, the least of which is, how did they do this? And then the major one is, why? Why do this? What does it mean to encode a prophecy into a psychedelic plant? 
and then to have people dig it out so close to the attractor event that they're really helpless to do anything other than witness it anyway. No, this is the stuff of pathology. It fills the back wards of our <laughs> private mental hospitals. But, you know, you know, something's going on. You just have to wonder. Well, that's a good question. Yes. Why the I Ching, which is what you're asking? How can, isn't it a little quirky to hang your whole theory on a mathematical sequence derived from an ancient Chinese book of divination? I mean, how dilettante can you get, you know? But the answer is no, because... What they were trying to do with the I Ching was they were trying to create a general topology of categories or a general uh, typographic list of temporal categories. And the way they did it was by looking into their minds, by stilling overt physiological functions like breathing and heartbeat, and looking into their minds and seeing phenomena which we might call mental, which they might call physical, which somebody else might call quantum mechanical, but the ontological status of this phenomena is not ultimately what's important. What's important is that careful observation be carried out on it and that it be correctly categorized. And what they saw was uh, the organizational rules of time itself and what put me on to the idea that this was not so strange was I noticed a year or so ago uh, I was looking at sand dunes and I noticed that sand dunes look like wind and this is a fairly trivial observation except for me it wasn't because I'd never thought it before I mean, we all, this always is tugging at the edge of your mind when you look at sand dunes, but for me it wasn't over. Okay, sand dunes look like wind. What does this mean? It means that a physical phenomenon, sand dunes, takes its form from its interaction against a wave mechanical phenomenon to wit the pressure fluctuation of wind over time. And I said, aha, uh -huh. so sand dune looks like wind because it was made by wind so then I said well then everything in the world bears the signature of the time wave within it because everything in the world arose within the context of time so you know it's no more odd that we have within ourselves the time wave than that pebbles are round from being rolled in the ocean. It's just a consequence of being in time is to carry the signature of what time is etched upon you, within you. And so these Taoist yogas or proto-Taoist yogas were looking at the organization of mind and seeing the archetype of organization itself because mind is some kind of fractal energy phenomenon that arises within the larger fractal context of organic nature which arises within the fractal context of um, you know electromagnetic forces or whatever so it's uh, what starts out looking like a miracle that the King Wen sequence could have a magical wave inside it that would describe human history ends up looking like a kind of unavoidable and trivial fact writ large over the face of all existence that all objects in time have internalized within themselves images of the larger process in which they are uh, embedded yeah, yeah. yeah. Yes, there are sequences other than King Wen and there are systems other than this. And I think it's a, it's a growth thing. You know, we're trying to see pattern. And no pattern is wrong, but no pattern is all of the pattern, at least not yet. Uh, one of the quotes that I'm fond of using vis-a-vis -vis this and the psychedelic experience 
is something that Alfred North Whitehead said about understanding. He said, understanding is apperception of pattern as such. That's all. As such. So if you look at this room and you look at women and where they're seated, seated you learn something about the people in this room. There's a pattern to how the women are seated. If on the other hand you look at the pattern of people who wear glasses, that's a different pattern. It also tells you something about the room. And there is just pattern upon pattern upon pattern. The people with blue eyes, where the Jews are sitting, where the Irish are sitting, you know, the older people, the younger people. There's no limit to the number of patterns that can be extracted from a situation. And each one somehow gives us more control over the situation. So what this is, is the pattern to process we know that there's a pattern to process because we have a very simple model like this in English and in most languages. It's that we, it's most of us agree that most things have a beginning, a middle, and an end. And, you know, if we're in the beginning, we look for the middle. If we've passed the middle, we're looking out for the end. This means we have a theory of process. And in a way, when you look at history's fractal mountain, it looks like the single discharge of a nerve. All it is is a beginning, a middle, and an end. And process can probably be broken down to that simple a level. But then, of course, as William Blake said, attend the minute particulars. It's all in the details. This is what psychedelics teach, I think, is it's all in the details. Getting there is half the fun. The experience of life is in the fabric of it, you know, the, the uh, actual tactility of the passing moment. Yeah. Well, what does the pattern look like between now and 2012? Between now and 2012? Let me see if I'm still together enough to get such a thing together. Is this everything correlated with astrology? Oh, yeah, different people have looked at it. Uh, let's see, specify target date. Let's say the first month, the first day of uh, 1995. Uh, let's say of 2000. Okay, and we're over here. We're poised up here. See, we're about to make the big descent. This will give you an idea. This was a good one to look at because this both gives us the perspective because it's hellish. Now there's the... Okay, that's <laughs> January, February. That's the 2nd of March. January, February. That's the 2nd of February, 1992. That's when all of this stuff is maximized. It's a long way in the future. All of 91, see, is down along here. Uh, where we are now, well, there's the projected date when the war goes over the hump. We're down here, 929.90. But approaching this extremely low level of, I you know, this huge expansion of the power of Islam and probably not so much good for America and the American banking industry. But then we have to live through all of this stuff, mm -hmm. a huge series of fluctuations, well past the turn of the century, before finally we're, we get on the long slide. And, uh, you know, it's fairly spectacular. It's an effort to explain the sense of time speeding up. Mm -hmm the sense of the acceleration and into deeper and deeper connectedness. It obviously can't go on uh, for centuries. It, it has to halt at some time in the past. But what, what our attention is going to be riveted on for the next little while is this, because this is the deepest level of novelty ever explored uh, to date. There's where we are uh, on the 10th of January having come from clear up here as recently as the 25th of November. Where is the, uh, if where we are now in relates to Muhammad's birth, mm -hmm. then where do we end up in 2021? 2012? 
oh well then it all comes together see I mean like in in uh, late 2011 we cross over into a 384 day period in which all these themes are recondensed again see here it shows that what we're progressing through we still have to go through the medieval period we'll do that in 96 97 the discovery of the new world occurs up here in uh, uh, 2005 and then you know the industrial revolution 2009 so forth and so on so it's a very steep compression uh, and then the way it works actually is when you get into these final epochs you get a 384 day cycle in which everything is recompressed then a six day cycle and and then you know a cycle that lasts an hour and a half and one that lasts 135 seconds and so forth <laughs> and it's the spin dizzy principle it's exactly the principle that's used to explain the birth of the universe by straight people except they put it all back in the first half nanosecond of the universe and I want to put it at the end and the reason mine seems more logical to me is what we're talking about here is an outlandish singularity well they say the singularity sprang from empty space seems to me the least likely median for a complex singularity to emerge from is a high vacuum more likely that a singularity would emerge from a teeming world of human beings and machines and psychedelic drugs and jungles and ecosystems and and that in a super rich informational matrix like that something might suddenly crystallize out that would be absolutely improbable and uh, and fulfill the, the the need for a, an attractor, a vector for novelty. Yeah. Well, the way the software is set, it's set for the dawn line uh, at La Chirera in the Amazon, which is also the dawn line for New York City. When we were doing our most uh, crazed thinking on this subject. Uh, the fantasy was that it would take 24 hours for it, then that it would follow, as you call it, the dawn line, the terminator of the planet, so that as the sun rose, it, all, it was hypothesized to have something to do with actually the geomagnetic strum, or what we call the heliomagnetic strum of the star. And so as the sun rose over a 24 hour period, this implosion would occur it's interesting I don't understand this theory in the sense that it seems to me it should be fairly easy to overthrow it's making such highly punctuated predictions it's not fudging its bets with a smooth curve and yet the, the attacks upon it have been unbelievably weak uh, it seemed, but but yet it's a curious thing. It's very hard to imagine how anyone could quote unquote figure this out. It seems that you would have to find it all at once, done somehow. There's no way into it where you could start to figure it out. So it it has this curious completedness. And as a person who was not even that interested in the I Ching and certainly less interested in diddling around with graph paper that I should be the John the Baptist of, of this new dispensation is pretty peculiar. <laughs> I'm not even into long division. <laughs> Liz. When, when, you were, when you were balancing out <coughs> various factors in, in taking up the, the theory of fractal of time, uh, for instance, you've been talking about the spread of Islam and its... Um, the growth of poetry and science and so forth within it. But as you mentioned, the Inquisition. One of the strengths and weaknesses of the theory is that it's pretty non-specific. You know, maybe astrology tries to say too much. Maybe this tries to say too little. Uh, but the Inquisition happened down... Uh, well, actually, it was stretched out over time, so it depends on what you're actually talking about. But the great novel century 
uh, the, the 15th century, the 1400s, occurs along this gradient. Yeah, novelty is a kind of morally neutral term. I mean, is an invading army raping and pillaging and mixing its genes with the local populace? Is this come out as a plus or a minus on the novelty scale? Uh, I, I don't know. I confess I'm puzzled by this. It's a pretty powerful concept. I mean, I think we do feel in our own lives the ebb and flow of this quality and that when it's you know, when you're hot, you're hot. When you're not, you're not. That's what that's saying. Yeah. Well, when you were talking earlier about novelty and shell rake and novelty versus habit, there was the upswings on this graph where I, I heard you describe this sort of, you know, conservatism. Mm -hmm. And the downswings were novelty and new things happening. Mm -hmm. New things like people in this room generally would like. At least that's how I was mm -hmm. hearing it. Oh, new things like generally people in this room would like. No. Things that orient themselves towards peace and... Oh, no, I don't think so. I think a world war here will do just fine to fulfill the novelty requirements of the situation. What amazed me about it was when I was sitting up here uh, after the Romanian Revolution and looking at this hole here, I was saying, boy, something outlandish is going to have to happen or we're going to have to toss this sucker right out the door. Well, then, lo and behold, you know, to, with this weird sense of deja vu and startled amazement and yet vindication, yet horror and disbelief and so forth, it all comes to pass. It fulfills an, imp an impossible prophecy. How many times can it do it? Check this out. We've got to get through this. But this thing occurs over a three-month period in 1995, from March to May of 1995. We have to undergo a descent into novelty that makes what we've been through and are going to go through look like peanuts. So there are built-in tests in the wave so that if it's junk, we should be able to get rid of it long before we're anywhere near 2012. And yet we're meeting now the first of these difficult tests, the first prediction of a steep descent into radical novelty. And, you know, the armies and chancelleries of the world are just rushing furiously to fulfill the prophecy. Yeah. <laughs> Uh, well, except that that's a kind of a uh, fart at the opera if what you believe is happening is a conservation of novelty, a knitting together, an ever deepening and enriching and connecting kind of thing, and then they drop the bomb. The only way that could redeem it is if you know, our real destiny is in another dimension and sort of like that wonderful scene at the end of Dr. Strangelove where they sing the song, We'll Meet Again Someday, Somewhere. Uh, I don't think it is nuclear holocaust. I think nuclear holocaust is the shadow of the al -Qaeda. It is, is uh, you know, somehow a way of coaxing the human soul into physical manifestation. I mean, the flying saucer, the extraterrestrial visitant, the philosopher's stone, alchemical mercury, to really realize our dreams. I mean, I think that that is really the, the promise of the psychedelic experience. The thing you find out at the core of the psychedelic experience that you cannot believe, no matter how hard you try, because it's so liberating, is that, you know, dreams are real, apparently. History, there is a way out. It isn't. The high walls, all that, it's an illusion. There's some tremendous act of intellectual apprehension or courage or something, and then you break through. You penetrate beyond the mask. There is a mask. There is a beyond the mask. But most people go to the grave without ever uh, even making the effort. Yeah. yeah, yeah. <laughs> 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 <laughs>
any other phenomenon like an RFB on an EKG or an oscilloscope readout of the music? Is there anything that you could get uh, formed to have a way to form it? Yeah, I mean, the way I think of it is uh, all phenomena are, are describable within this wave matrix. And when I was at my most illuminated or loaded or however you want to put it, I could actually see it overlaid over reality. I could actually see that people, people are knots of novelty in local genetic space. The, the local space is largely empty and then there are these knots of space-time where genetic expression and protein transcription is going on. And these are people and they represent, you know, this extreme concrescence of novelty. Well, then, if you're in a city or something, you see that it is a larger yet more diffuse knot of the same kind of novelty. And, you know, I don't know whether you're losing your mind or assimilating a wave mechanical way of looking at things, but this is very, it comes close almost to some of the ravings of Carlos Castaneda, you know, that there's a way of shifting perception and processing information, and then you see that, you know, people are interlocking networks of light. They are confluences of casuistry, both in space and time, as well as in matter. And uh, no, I was quite into all of this. Uh, and it sort of sticks with me. It's model building. Yeah. yeah um, I, was, I see the relationship between like, chaos and novelty, but this seems like such a rigid order to me, and I don't see a balance in chaos to it. You know what I'm saying? Well, it's rigid on one level and free on another. Um, what's rigid about this is that it says where the novelty will occur. What's open about it is it never says what the novelty will be. So that, you know, Saddam Hussein could probably avert a world war by just uh, announcing that he's going on a world ballet tour and that would be so novel that the wave would be fulfilled and the war averted and his touring ballet company. What? He could be assassinated, although that isn't in his situation. That wouldn't exactly be absolutely startling. It would be a fairly traditional pattern asserting itself. But you're right. Assassinations are interesting because uh, their history comes to such a micro pivot there. Uh, I find assassinations very interesting. There are very little wear and tear on innocent people, you'll notice. That's why it's so little favored as a way of settling political <laughs> problems. <laughs> <laughs> But I have a German correspondent who is taking this between the teeth and run with it. And he sent me a bunch of assassination printouts on a scale of 30 days. The assassination of John F. Kennedy, Wallenstein, Himmler, a bunch of people. And they're, you know, it's tantalizing. I mean, I don't know what to make of this. Uh, it's reasonable that large-scale phenomena like history, like glaciations, would be under the control of recursive laws, algorithmically expressible laws. The hard swallow is to think that you've actually figured one out, you know, and that this is it, and that to the exclusion of all other values, these values somehow define it. But I think that... Thinking of history as a novelty-conserving journey of return to the green mind is a much more helpful, existentially anchoring notion than to think of it as a chaotic, trendless fluctuation toward self-immolation. You know, just a drunken person wandering around in a dynamite storage area, which is sort of the other model being peddled. Uh, because I believe that there is a purpose, that there is some kind of telos working its way out. I don't want get all dewy eyed about it. Uh, I don't even know why or what for, but I just know that 
statistical models of how human reality works are completely inadequate. I mean, the way most people experience magic in their lives is through the phenomenon of uh, falling in love. And it's highly statistically improbable the way it works. I mean, you know, you can be the guy who sweeps up in the mail room and every day you see the boss's daughter alight in her Rolls Royce to be swept into the executive suite or some nonsense like that. And by merely forming the wish to be with this woman, you know, then coincidences begin to move promotions occur, deaths occur, mountains are moved, and before you know it, you know, the princess is delivered unto your arms, for better or worse, one might add. I mean, you need to be very careful about what you wish for, because you usually get it. Uh, uh, the rule about wishing seems to be, it's a kind of a quantum mechanical process, and no jerking is allowed. The key to having your wishes fulfilled is slow, steady pressure. You know, and if you can hold an image for two or three years, it hardly matters how outlandish it is. It will probably be delivered unto you uh, in fairly good order. I'm struck by this one. The micro, micro macrocosm aspect of it. Yeah, that this goes right down from the level of Planck's constant right up to the size of the universe. And it's saying the same patterns, the same processes are recursive and are nested. And uh, basically the all rightness of everything. Because what it shows is, you know, this is a fairly chaotic wave. It looks stochastic. Mm -hmm. But it's manipulated in such a way that out of its disorder emerges a very elegant, self-reinforcing, self-refining order. And that's what I see in the universe. The universe is this same kind of uh, thing. Saving novelty, refining connectedness, streamlining itself for further journey into time. Well, that's enough of that, I think. Please continue to tape six.